In this video, we're going to review transfer functions and the implications of the transfer functions. In general, a transfer function in S space looks something like this. We have a numerator that consists of an nth order polynomial and a denominator that consists of an mth order polynomial. Now we can factor these polynomials out. And if we factor out the, the polynomials in the numerator and the denominator, we will find roots of the polynomials. The roots of the polynomials in the numerator are called zeros, and the roots of the polynomials in the denominator are called holes. Now note the zeros can have a positive or a negative frequency value, and the poles can have a positive or negative frequency value. If the zeros or poles have a positive value, they're in the left half plane of the complex plane, and if they have a negative value, they would be in the right half plane of the complex plane, or their, or their solutions would be in the left half plane and right half plane. Now, we can analyze, in general, poles and zeros one at a time. So let's assume that we have a transfer function that has a single left half plane pole. Here I have a transfer function where I've normalized it by the frequency of the pole, omega p. So the transfer function is omega p divided by s plus omega p. Now I can write this in the frequency domain as h of j omega is equal to omega p divided by j omega plus omega p. Now if I multiply this by the complex conjugate minus j omega plus omega p divided by minus j omega plus omega p, my transfer function takes the form omega p squared over omega squared plus omega p squared minus j omega times omega p divided by omega squared plus omega p squared. So I have a complex transfer function now I can find the magnitude of this transfer function by taking the square root of the sum of the squares of the real and imaginary part. And I can find the phase by taking the arctangent of the imaginary part over the real part. So let's first find the amplitude response. So here I have the magnitude of h of j omega is equal to the square root of omega squared divided by omega squared plus omega p squared quantity squared plus omega times omega p divided by omega squared plus omega p squared quantity squared. We can do some algebra to factor out this equation and end up with the following. So here's our expression. h of j omega is equal to 1 plus omega divided by omega p squared, that whole quantity, to the minus 1 half power. In other words, 1 over the square root of that quantity. Now, if we want to find this in dB, we take 10 times the log of this quantity. So here's our expression in dB. Now let's do some manipulation. Then we have the following expression. Now what we see for this is for omega much, much less than omega p, h of j omega and db is pretty close to 0 dBs. In other words, the transfer function doesn't have very much change. From omega equal to omega p, h of j omega is equal to minus 3 dB. And for omega greater than omega p, the change in the transfer function as a function of frequency is equal to minus 20 dBs per decade. In other words, every factor of 10 of omega 
we see a decrease in the transfer function of minus 20 dBs. All right, next we're going to calculate the phase response for this transfer function. All right, for the phase response, we simply take the imaginary portion divided by the real portion and take the arctangent of that. So our phase of h of j omega is equal to tangent inverse of minus j omega divided by omega p. Now for omega much, much less than omega p, the arc that would be the arc tangent of a very small number, and this is pretty close to zero degrees. For omega equals to omega p, this would be the arc tangent of negative one, and this is equal to negative 45 degrees. And finally, for omega much, much greater than omega p, then the arc tangent of a very large number approaches minus 90 degrees. So now we can plot a Bode plot of the frequency response of this amplifier. So for our Bode plot, we know that we have a magnitude of zero dBs approximately up until the pole frequency. And then we roll off at 20 dBs per decade. So we have a constant slope in our roll off. Now we know that in reality, this response is going to look something a bit more like this, where at the pole frequency, the attenuation is exactly minus 3 dB. But it's fairly common to draw the straight line approximation that I've shown in the solid red line. Now for the phase response, again, we start at 0 degrees. We know that at the pole frequency, we have a phase shift of minus 45 degrees, and then this is going to asymptotically approach 90 degrees at high frequencies. Now again, it's very common to use a straight line approximation where we assume that we have a relatively constant phase shift, that the phase shift is zero degrees up until a frequency of about 0 0.1 omega p and it reaches about 90 degrees at 10 times omega p. Now again, the actual shape of this line would be an arc tangent, but the straight line approximation works. All right, so the last thing to do is let's look at a step response. All right. So for a step response, we assume that we have an input x of s equal to 1 over s. This is a step response in the Laplacian domain. Now, this corresponds to a function x of t that equals 1 for t greater than 0 and equals 0 for t less than or equal to 0. To find the step response, we assume that the output of our transfer function would be equal to h of s times x of s. So this is equal to omega p divided by s plus omega p times 1 over s. And our time domain y of t would be equal to the inverse Laplace transform of y of s. Now we can go and find the Laplace transform or inverse Laplace transform using tables and we would find that this was equal to h of t which is the heavy side step function minus e to the minus omega p times t. We can now look at this in the time domain. x of t is given by this line here, so it's a normal step function. It's 0 until time equals 0, and then it jumps up to its final value. And our equation for y of t tells us that we're going to have an exponential increase starting at time t equals zero, that will asymptotically approach the final value, which is the final value of the step function.
All right, so this is what we expect for a right half plane pole. We've looked at the frequency response in terms of a Bode plot, and we've also looked at the step response uh, using uh, an input step and looked to see what the output does. So in the next couple of videos, we're going to also look at right half plane pole, a left half plane zero, and a right half plane zero. And we'll do those in the next videos.